Appendix. Number 1. Genesee County, SS, Lucinda Morgan, aged 23, the wife of William Morgan, of Batavia, in said county, being duly sworn, deposeth and saith, that on Monday last, about, or a short time before, sunrise, her said husband left his house, and went into the street of the village, that finding he did not come home to his breakfast as usual, she made inquiries for him, and was told that he had been forcibly taken away by six men, and put into a carriage and taken to Canandaigua. That during the whole of Monday she remained in ignorance of which way he had been taken, or who had taken him, excepting by loose information, that an officer from Canandaigua had taken him. That on Tuesday morning soon after breakfast she sent for William R. Thompson, the sheriff, and requested to know of him if he knew on what pretext her husband had been taken away. Said Thompson told her he understood he had been taken under a charge of having stolen a shirt and cravat, and that he presumed it was merely a pretext to get him away, or carry him away, that thereupon this deponent, asked him if he thought Mr. Morgan could be got back, or brought back, if she gave up to the Masons the papers she had in possession, said Thompson answered that he thought it was very likely that Mr. Morgan would be brought back if she would give them up but he would not obligate himself, or undertake to say that he should be brought back. That thereupon said Thompson proposed that this deponent should go to Canandaigua, and take the papers, and give them to Morgan, or to them, or give them up, and deponent agreed to go and take the papers accordingly. Thompson then asked this deponent if there was any person or friend whom she would like to have go with her. She mentioned Mr. Gibbs, meaning Horace Gibbs, and asked if it would do for him to go, said Thompson said it would not do for him to go, as he was not a mason, and added, it would not do for any person to carry her there but a mason. She asked him twice if Mr. Gibbs was not a mason, and he said he was not, and then asked the opponent if she was acquainted with Mr. Follett, the opponent said she was not. Thompson said he was a nice man, and a gentleman with whom she could safely trust herself. Said Thompson departed, and soon returned, and told the opponent that Mr. Follet was not willing to go, unless she would let him, Follet, and Mr. Ketchum see the papers, he did not want to go on a Tom Fool's errand. This deponent then objected to the papers being seen by them, Thompson then said it was useless, he should do no more, and he could not send her out there unless they could see the papers. Deponent then, with great reluctance, finally consented to let them see the papers, if they would take her to see her husband. This second visit lasted about twenty minutes, during which time Thompson urged the deponent to let the papers be seen. The deponent told him she was afraid they would take the papers away from her, if she let them see them. Thompson said they would not. She offered to let Mr. Thompson see the papers, he said that would not answer, they would not take his word. Thompson then told her he would go to Humphreys and stay until she had got the papers, and she must then make a sign to him when she was ready. Accordingly, a short time afterwards she made a sign to Mr. Thompson, then standing on Humphrey's stoop, and immediately after, he, with Mr. Follett, and Mr. Ketchum, came to her apartment, when Thompson introduced Follett and Ketchum, and said they had come to see the papers, which this deponent then handed to them. They all looked at them a short time, and Thompson then asked her if she was ready to go, saying, Mr. Follett was ready to take her. Follett then said he would go home with the papers, and look them over, and told Ketchum to stop for him at his gate. Accordingly, about four o'clock in the afternoon of Tuesday, deponent started with said Follett and Ketchum in a small wagon, and proceeded to Stafford, where they stopped at a house, where she was conducted into a back room, into which Follett and Ketchum came, and were joined by one Daniel Johns, and by James Gansin, all of whom immediately proceeded to examine the papers with much earnestness, and held much low conversation with themselves in under voices. Gansin appeared to speak the most. One of them then asked Johns if those were the papers that were in the office when he was there. Johns answered there was one degree back, and then took a piece of paper, and folding it up, said the papers that were back were folded so. They then held considerable more conversation in voices too low to be heard. Follett then turned to deponent, and told her he did not see that he could go with her, that Mr. Ketchum was going to Rochester, and would be willing to take her to Canandaigua to see Mr. Morgan, said he was not much acquainted with him, Ketchum, but took him to be a gentleman, and Ketchum then said he called himself a gentleman, and she need not be afraid to trust herself with him. Ketchum then took the papers, and tied them up in his pocket handkerchief, and took them with him into the wagon in which they rode. Johns then got into the wagon, and rode to Leroy, 
when he got out, and bid Ketchum goodbye, saying, I hope I shall see you day after tomorrow. They then proceeded to Avon, and stayed all night. The next day they again started for Canandaigua, when Ketchum put the papers into this deponent's trunk. They arrived at Canandaigua about twelve, at noon, and stopped at a tavern at the corner of the main street. After being there some time, this deponent asked Ketchum if he had heard of Mr. Morgan. Ketchum said he had not, that the Masons could not talk to him, he could not see them, they seemed jealous of him, thought him a friend of Mr. Morgan, and was afraid he had come to get him away from that place. Then asked her where the papers were, he took them, and said he would go and make further inquiries for Mr. Morgan, and if he could find him, or where he was, or where they had taken him, he would let her know all he could find out. This was about dinner time. He returned again a short time before night, and told her he had heard Mr. Morgan had been there, had been tried for stealing a shirt, and cleared, had been then put in jail for a debt of two dollars, and that Tuesday night a man had come from Pennsylvania, who said he had a warrant against him for a debt he owed there, that he, the man, had paid the two dollars, and had taken him away in a private carriage on Tuesday night, and he had no doubt he was gone, and asked this deponent when she would go home again. The deponent then expressed her anxiety to return speedily on account of having left her child of two years old, and having with her a baby of two months old. Ketchum then went out, as he said, to take a passage in the stage, and returned after candle light. This deponent was then walking the room in great distress, and in tears. She asked him if he could hear nothing of Mr. Morgan. He then seemed to pity deponent, and told her not to be uneasy, and after looking at her a short time, told her to come and sit down by him, and asked her if she would feel any better if he told her what he knew. Being answered yes, he then said that Mr. Morgan would not be killed, that he would be kept concealed until they could get the rest of the papers. She asked him what papers were back. He said there were some sheets on the Mark Master's degree back, and they wanted also to get the printed sheets that Miller had printed on the three degrees. He then said he wanted to take the papers he had received from this deponent to Rochester, and he thought through the means of them he could find out where Mr. Morgan was, it was a secret where he was. Said he had paid her passage, and then gave her two dollars to bear her expenses home. He then wrote his name with a pencil on a scrap of paper, hereto annexed as follows, George Ketchum, Rochester, and promised to write to her if he could hear he of Mr. Morgan, he then told her if she would, by any means, get hold of the papers that Miller had, or find out where they were deposited, so that he could get hold of them, he would give her twenty-five dollars out of his own pocket, and he had no doubt the lodge would give her one hundred if she could get what Miller had now. The opponent told him she would not try to get the papers that Miller had, and would take no money, and would not let him have the papers she had delivered to him, but on condition he would try and find out where Mr. Morgan was, and let her see him. He then repeated this promise to try and find out, and said he would write to her as soon as he got to Rochester, and urged her to write to him immediately on her return, and let him know about the papers, and what the people were doing generally in Batavia, and whether they were making a great rumpus about Mr. Morgan. The opponent then expressed her fears, that if she did give him any information about the papers, he would not keep his promise about letting her see him, but would keep him concealed until they got all the papers, and finally kill him. Ketchum then said, I promise before my God that I will not deceive you, but will do all I can to find out where thee is, and let you see him. I have no doubt when I get back to Rochester I can find out more, and I think I can find out where he is. He then again urged her to find out where the papers were, and let him know. In the course of his conversation he said, that if Mr. Morgan had managed rightly he could have made a million of dollars, if the work had been published. Ketchum then departed for Rochester, leaving this deponent at the tavern, she, the same day, started for Batavia. The papers taken away by the said Ketchum were numerous, and formed a very large bundle, they were written in the handwriting of her husband, excepting a few, which were written by a person who sometimes assisted her husband by copying, or taking down, as he dictated to him. The deponent further says she has no knowledge of the place where her husband now is, or what is his situation, and feels the most anxious fears for his life, that she was born in Virginia, and is a stranger, without any intimate friends or relations in this country, and is left with two infant children, without any money, except what is left of that given to her by said Ketchum, and has no property nor any means of supporting herself and her children, her constitution being very feeble, and her health being bad most of the time. L. Morgan. 
sworn the 22nd day of September, 1826, before me, Daniel H. Chandler, J. P. No. 2. State of New York, Ontario County, S.S. Mary W. Hall, of Canandaigua, in said county, being duly sworn, deposeth and saith, that she is the wife of Israel R. Hall, keeper of the common jail of said county, that she, this deponent, the said keeper, her husband, and family, reside in the jail of said county, that she, this deponent, and her husband, had been absent, and returned home on the 12th of September instant, in the afternoon, that in the early part of the evening of the said 12th day of September, her husband went out from the jail, that soon after her husband left the jail, and about seven o'clock in the evening, or a little past, a man who, afterwards and during the same evening said his name was Lawson, called at the jail and inquired for Mr. Hall, the keeper, and she, this deponent. Informed the said Lawson that Mr. Hall was not at home, and that she did not know where he was, that the said Lawson then said that he wanted to see Morgan, alluding, as this deponent supposed, to a man in prison by the name of William Morgan, that this deponent then went to the door of the room in which the said Morgan was confined, that the said Lawson requested to go into the room where Morgan was, but this deponent told him he could not. For it was against the rules of the prison, that the said Lawson said he wished to have a few moments private conversation with Morgan, but this deponent told Lawson he could not say anything to Morgan but what this deponent should hear, that the said Lawson then spoke to Morgan through the grates of the door, and said he wished to have some private conversation with him, the said Morgan, but this woman, alluding to this deponent, would not let him, that this deponent then said to Lawson, Who be you? Do you live in the village? To which the said Lawson made no reply, but the said Morgan said he is a neighbor, that the said Lawson told Morgan he had come to the debt for which the said Morgan was committed, and Lawson asked Morgan if he would go home with him, to which Morgan answered, Yes, that Lawson then said, When Mr. Hall, meaning the said keeper, came in, he, Lawson, would satisfy the execution, and take him, the said Morgan, out, and carry him home, that the said Morgan answered it was no matter about it that night. He could wait till morning, that Lawson said no, he would rather take him, the said Morgan, out, and carry him home with him that night, for he had been running all day for him, and he was so tired he could hardly stand on his feet, that the said Lawson then went away, and said he would look for Mr. Hall, the said keeper, that in about half an hour the said Lawson returned, and said he had been to the hotel, conference room, and every other place in which he thought he should be likely to find Mr. Hall, but he could not find him, that the said Lawson then requested that this deponent should receive the amount of the execution on which Morgan was committed, and discharge him, but this deponent refused to do this, and told Lawson she did not know the amount, that Lawson told her it was a small sum, and he, Lawson, would leave five dollars, which he knew was more than sufficient, that this deponent then told Lawson that she, this deponent, had understood that Morgan was a rogue, and that she did not like to liberate a rogue, that she, this deponent, understood great pains had been taken to secure Morgan, and that the public or individuals were interested in having him kept secure, that what she, this deponent, should do would be considered the same as if it had been done by her husband, the said keeper, and if she, this deponent, should discharge Morgan. She was afraid her husband would be blamed, that Lawson said no, Mr. Hall would not be blamed, and represented to this deponent that Mr. Hall understood it perfectly, and if he was at home would discharge Morgan, and further, he, Lawson, said he would pledge himself that Mr. Halley should not be injured or blamed, that he, Lawson, would pledge himself to the amount of fifty or an hundred dollars that Mr. Hall should not be injured if this deponent would discharge Morgan, but this deponent refused. And told Lawson she valued public opinion more than money, that Lawson then asked this deponent if she would discharge Morgan if Colonel Sawyer, meaning, as this deponent supposes, one Edward Sawyer, of Canandaigua aforesaid, would say she could safely do it, and that it would be right, or if he would pledge himself that Mr. All should not be injured, or would run no risk in discharging Morgan, that she, this deponent, answered that she did not know Colonel Sawyer any better than C. did him. Lawson, and that Colonel Sawyer was not plaintiff in the execution upon which Morgan was committed, and that he, Colonel Sawyer, had nothing to do with it, that, however, Lawson then went away, and said he would go and see Colonel Sawyer, that Lawson then went away, and was gone but a few minutes when he, Lawson, returned, and Colonel Sawyer with him, that Colonel Sawyer requested that this deponent would discharge Morgan, 
and said there could be no kind of risk in doing so. That Mr. Hall should not be injured, that Lawson would pay the debt, and there could be no harm in discharging the prisoner when that was done, that this deponent said she did not wish to keep a man in jail who ought to be let out, but she did not wish to liberate a rogue. As she understood Morgan was one, that nearly the same conversation again took place as had before passed between this deponent and Lawson, that Colonel Sawyer and Lawson appeared to be offended, that this deponent would not discharge Morgan, that Lawson said the debt for which Morgan was committed was assigned to Casebro, meaning, as this deponent supposed, and afterwards. Learned, Nicholas G. Casebro, that Lawson said to Sawyer, let us go and find Casebro, that they both went to the door, and this deponent also, and saw two men a few rods from the jail coming towards it, that this deponent observed that, perhaps, one of them might be Mr. Hall, upon which Lawson went towards them, and directly one of the said men came to the door of the jail where this deponent and Colonel Sawyer were standing, that this deponent asked if it was Mr. Casebro, to which the man answered yes. And this deponent immediately recognized him to be the said Nicholas G. Casebro, that this deponent said to Casebro, there is a man in jail that these men, meaning Lawson and Colonel Sawyer, want me to liberate, and they say you are interested, or that you have bought the debt, that Casebro said let him go, these men will pay the execution, I don't want to see him, I have no demands upon him, that this deponent in the early part of the evening, and before Mr. Hall left the jail, had observed Mr. Hall and Casebro in low conversation, and supposed that probably it was understood between them, she, this deponent, then consented to receive the amount of the execution, and discharge Morgan, that during the evening a man had been to the jail with Lawson, that Lawson called Foster, but unknown to this deponent, that Lawson, after this deponent consented to receive the amount of the execution, and discharge Morgan, paid to this deponent the said amount of execution, or laid it on the table, that then this deponent took the keys and was going to liberate Morgan, that Lawson spoke to this deponent and said, wait, and I will go with you, that Lawson then stepped to the door and whistled, and then followed this deponent, that when they came to the outer door of the prison, Lawson said to this deponent, you need not fasten this door after us, but this deponent said she should, for there were other prisoners in the room. That this deponent and Lawson went into the hall adjoining the room where Morgan was, and Lawson spoke in a low voice to Morgan through the grates, get yourself ready to go with me, dress yourself quick, that Morgan was soon ready, and this deponent let him out, and Lawson took Morgan by the arm and went out of the prison to the outer door, that while this deponent was fastening the prison door she heard, at or near the outer door of the jail a most distressing cry of murder, that this deponent ran to the door, and saw Lawson and the man that he called Foster, one on each side of Morgan, having hold of Morgan's arms, that Morgan continued to scream or cry in the most distressing manner, at the same time struggling with all his strength, apparently, to get loose from Lawson and Foster, that the cry of Morgan continued till his voice appeared to be suppressed by something put over his mouth, that during the time that Morgan was struggling, and crying murder, the said Colonel Sawyer, and the said Casebro, were standing at a short distance from the jail door, near the well, and in full view and hearing of all that passed, but offered no assistance to Morgan, nor did they attempt to release him from Lawson and Foster, but one of them struck with a stick a violent blow upon the well curb, or a tub. Standing near, that soon after this deponent saw a carriage pass the jail in the direction that Lawson and Foster took Morgan, that the evening was quite light in consequence of its being about the full of the moon, that she, this deponent, could distinguish from the jail door the horses in the carriage which passed to be grey, that this deponent supposed the striking upon the well curb, or tub, by Casebro or Colonel Sawyer, was a signal for the carriage to come, as it came immediately after, that when the carriage passed, Lawson and Foster could not have got but a few rods with Morgan, that immediately after the striking upon the well curb, or tub, Colonel Sawyer, and, as this deponent thinks, Casebro also, passed the jail door in the direction that Lawson and Foster took Morgan, but not apparently to render Morgan any assistance towards being released from Lawson and Foster, but Colonel Sawyer, however, picked up Morgan's hat, which had fallen off in the struggle, that when Morgan was taken from the jail it was about nine o'clock in the evening, or a little past, that this deponent has since been informed that Lawson lies about two or three miles from the jail, that this deponent has never seen Morgan since he was taken from the jail as aforesaid, and knows nothing about where he was taken to, or where he now is, and further saith not. Mary W. Hall. Subscribed and sworn to, this 23rd day of September, 
1826, before me, Jeffrey Chipman, J. P. No. 3. State of New York, Ontario County, S.S. Daniel Tallmadge, being duly sworn, deposeth and saith, that he now is, and on the eleventh day of September instant, was, a prisoner in the jail of said county, at Canandaigua, that on the evening of the said eleventh day of September, a man, whose name this deponent learned was William Morgan, was committed to said jail, and put into the room with this deponent, that during the following day Morgan asked this deponent whether Mr. Hall, the jailer, was a mason, and said if he was, he, Morgan, would fare hard. As he was suspected of an intention to reveal the secrets of masonry, that early in the evening of the same day, being the twelfth, Mrs. Hall, the wife of the said jailer, together with a man whose name this deponent understood to be Lawson, came to the door of the prison room, in which this deponent and Morgan were, that Lawson said he came to pay the debt on which Morgan was committed, and let him out, to which Morgan consented, that after Lawson went away. As this deponent understood, to find Mr. Hall, the jailer. Morgan said to this deponent, if that man, Lawson, was a traitor to him, Morgan, he would not give much for his life, that Morgan had some doubts about trusting himself with Lawson, but upon the whole concluded he would, that some time after, during the same evening, Lawson came again to the room where this deponent and Morgan were, and Mrs. Hall, the wife of the jailer, let Morgan out, and Lawson went out with Morgan, that in a moment after, this deponent heard a cry of murder, which appeared to be near or at the outer door of the jail, that the said cry of murder, was repeated two or three times till it appeared to be suppressed, and further this deponent saith not. Daniel Tallmadge. Subscribed and sworn to, this twenty-third day of September, 1826, before me, Geoffrey Chipman, J. P. No. 4. State of New York, Ontario County, S.S. Martha Davis, wife of Nathan Davis, of Canandaigua, in said county, being duly sworn, deposeth and saith, that she resides nearly opposite the jail, in Canandaigua, that on the evening of the twelfth day of September, instant, she, this deponent, saw a number of men walking, standing, and sitting in the street, and by the fence by the side of the street, about and near the jail, that this deponent could recognize but three of the men, to wit, Colonel Edward Sawyer, Nicholas G. Casebro, and Chauncey Co., all of Canandaigua aforesaid, that at one time this deponent was out at the door, and spoke to said Casebro, but he made no answer, that there were in all about eight or ten men, that they seemed to be consulting together in an undertone, as this deponent thought, and she expressed her fears to her husband that something was going on about the jail which was not right, that about nine o'clock in the evening this deponent heard the fastenings of the prison doors, as she frequently does when the doors are opened, that at the same time this deponent discovered two men near the jail door, and also, two men on the opposite side of the street from the jail, and but a little distance from the house of this deponent, that immediately after, this deponent heard a cry of murder near the jail door, and discovered men apparently in a scuffle, that at the same time she heard a violent rap apparently upon the well curb, near the jail door. And one of the men who were seated near the house of this deponent immediately ran past the house of this deponent, and in a direction from the place from which the cry of murder proceeded, that the cry of murder seemed to be suppressed as by a hand, or something similar, upon the mouth, which appeared at times to be partly removed in the struggle, and then this deponent could hear an inarticulate sound, indicating great distress, that immediately after the rap upon the well curb, this deponent discovered a carriage, which she supposed to be the carriage of Mr. Hubbard, who keeps horses and carriages to let, with two grey horses, coming down the street very rapidly, but could not discover anyone in the carriage, that the carriage passed the house of this deponent towards the place where this deponent had heard the last cries of distress, as aforesaid, that the carriage was gone a few minutes, and then returned with men in it, and passed back again by the house of this deponent, and further this deponent saith not. Martha Davis. Subscribed and sworn to, this twenty-third day of September, 1826, before me, Geoffrey Chipman, J. P. No. 5. State of New York, Ontario County, S.S. Lassira I. Osborne, daughter of Seth Osborne of Canandaigua, in said county, aged about twenty-four years, being duly sworn, deposeth and saith, that on the evening of the twelfth of September, instant, about nine o'clock in the evening, she, this deponent, was in the chamber of her father's house, which is but a few feet from the jail in Canandaigua, that this deponent heard some bustle about the house, apparently near the jail door, 
that this deponent then heard a cry of murder, apparently about in front of her father's house, in the street, and but a few feet from the house, that the distinct cry of murder, which this deponent first heard, was soon suppressed into an inarticulate sound of distress, and soon ceased, that just before the time that this deponent heard the said cry of murder, she heard someone whistle, and then, or soon after, a loud rap upon the well curb, as this deponent supposes, as it appeared to be at the well. A few rods from the jail door, that this deponent then heard a carriage pass in the street, that this deponent soon after came down from the chamber, and a carriage passed the other way, having two grey horses before the carriage, and further this deponent saith not. Lassira I. Osborne. Subscribed and sworn to, this 23rd day of September, 1826, before me, Geoffrey Chipman, J. P. No. 6. State of New York, Ontario County, S.S. Seth Osborne of Pafcanandagua, in said county, being duly sworn, deposeth and saith, that on the evening of the 12th of September, instant, about nine o'clock, or between nine and ten o'clock, he, this deponent, went to the door of his house, which is near the jail in Canandaigua, that he saw some men a few rods from his door, that one of the men appeared to be partly down and struggling, and making a faint noise of distress, that this deponent went towards the men, one of whom was a little behind the rest. And this deponent asked him what was the matter. To which the man, whom this deponent understood and believes to have been Colonel Sawyer, of Canandaigua, aforesaid, answered, nothing, only a man has been let out of jail, and been taken on the warrant, and is going to be tried, or to have his trial, upon which this deponent went back into his house, and further saith not. Seth Osborne. Subscribed and sworn to, this twenty-third day of September, 1826, before me, Geoffrey Chipman, J. P. Number 7. Genesee County, S.S. Timothy Fitch, of Batavia, in said county, being duly sworn, deposeth and saith, that on the twenty-third day of September instant, he, this deponent, was at Canandaigua, and saw Hiram Hubbard, and this deponent asked Hubbard if he knew anything about William Morgan being taken away from Canandaigua, and Hubbard said he did not, but on the evening that it was said Morgan was taken away, he, Hubbard, was applied to, to carry some men to Rochester, and he agreed to go with his carriage, as he did frequently, but he did not know who applied to him on this occasion, that he expected they would get into his carriage at Mr. Kingsley's tavern, in Canandaigua, but in the evening, about nine o'clock, a man whom he did not know, came to him, and said the party had gone down the road towards Palmyra, and wished him to come along, and they would get into the carriage when he overtook them, that he, Hubbard, then drove down the road as he was requested, passed the jail a few rods, until he saw some men in the road, who told him to stop, and five or six men got into the carriage. But he did not know one of them, that they then told him to turn about and go to Rochester, which he did that he stopped twice on the road, and passed through Rochester about daylight, and continued on to Hanford's Landing, about three miles below Rochester, where the men said they wanted to take a vessel, that he then left them, and returned home to Canandaigua, that he did not know one of the men whom he carried, though he saw them on the road when they stopped. And also when they got out of the carriage at Hanford's Landing, that he had never been paid anything for going with said party to Hanford's Landing, and did not know who to look to for pay, that one of the men said to him he would see him another day and pay him, but he did not know who it was, nor had he ever seen him since, or any one of the party, that he, Hubbard, kept a livery stable, and horses and carriages, and frequently carried people to different places. And this deponent further saith, that he asked Hubbard to make affidavit of what he had said, but Hubbard said he had rather not, and finally declined. And this deponent further saith, that the place described by Hubbard where he took the party into his carriage, was but a few rods from the jail, and near the place where Mrs. Hall and Mrs. Osborne deposed they saw Morgan last, on the evening he was taken from the jail, and further saith not. Timothy Fitch. Subscribed and sworn to, this twenty-ninth day of September, 1826, before me, C. Carpenter, J. P. No. 8. Ontario Oyer and Termine. Nicholas G. Casebro, Edward Sawyer, Lowton Lawson, John Sheldon adds. The people? Nicholas G. Casebro, being duly sworn, deposeth and saith, that since the finding of the indictment in the above entitled cause, and in the course of last week, this deponent has been served with a copious ad respondendum, issued out of the Supreme Court, of the State of New York, at the suit of William Morgan, for assault and battery, 
and false imprisonment, to the damage to the said William Morgan, of $10,000, and this deponent has been held to bail in virtue of said writ, and an allowance of bail thereon endorsed, for $1,500, that this deposant doth verily believe that the said copious was issued against this deponent, as the commencement of a suit by the said William Morgan against this deponent, for his private damages sustained, by reason of the facts disclosed in the indictment, in the above entitled cause, and this deponent further saith, that he saw the said William Morgan in the office of J. Shipman, Esquire, a Justice of the Peace, in the village of Canandaigua, on the evening of the 11th September last, during his examination before the said Justice, and that he has not seen him since that time, this deponent knew that it was intended to release the said Morgan from jail, and was informed, and verily believed, that the said Morgan had consented to go away, and that the only object of this deponent, in assisting to get said Morgan out of jail, was to keep him from falling into the hands, or under the influence of one, David C. Miller, of Batavia, that he, this deponent, had been informed, and believed, that said William Morgan was compiling a book on the subject of masonry, at the instigation, or with the concurrence, of said Miller, who was to print the same, with a view to pecuniary profit, in which book the said Morgan pretended to disclose secrets which he averred that he had most solemnly engaged never to reveal, that deeming such publication calculated to degrade the institution of masonry, and to bring disgrace on the members thereof, this deponent was desirous to remove the said Morgan to some place beyond the reach of the said Miller, where his friends and acquaintance might endeavor to convince him of the impropriety of his conduct, and prevent the consequence before mentioned. That this deponent was not concerned, directly or indirectly, in using any force in the removal of the said Morgan from the said jail, and that he has had no concern whatever, in any transactions concerning the said Morgan since that time. That all he knows of said removal is, that he has been informed that the said Morgan was carried into the county of Monroe, and that this deponent does not know where said Morgan now is. And this deponent further saith, that he is somewhat in debt, has but little property, a family to provide for, and feels, in common with his fellow citizens, the pressure of the times, and further saith not. N. G. Casebro. Sworn this fifth day of January, 1827, before me, Ralph Lester, Clerk of Ontario County. Number 9. Ontario County, S.S. Edward Sawyer, of Canandaigua, one of the above-named defendants, being duly sworn, deposes and says, that he never to his knowledge saw William Morgan, mentioned in the indictment in this cause, until the evening of the eleventh day of September last past, when he saw him at the office of Geoffrey Chipman, Esquire, in the village of Canandaigua, under examination, on a complaint against him, as this deponent was informed, for larceny. And this deponent further says, that he had no knowledge or intimation, in any manner whatever, that any person or persons were to go for the said Morgan, or that they had gone for the said Morgan, to bring him to Canandaigua, until he was informed that he was at the office of the said Chipman on the said examination. And this deponent further says, that he took no part, either directly or indirectly, in the said examination, or in any subsequent proceedings by which the said Morgan was committed, as this deponent has been informed, to the jail of Ontario County. And this deponent further says, that he had no knowledge or intimation of any design or intention to liberate or remove the said Morgan from the said jail in any manner whatever, until the evening of the twelfth day of September last, when Loton Lawson met this deponent in the street near the dwelling of this deponent, and informed this deponent that Morgan had agreed to go away with him, and that he was about to be discharged from the jail, and would voluntarily leave the place with the said Lawson. And some time after that, in the course of the same evening, the said Lawson called on this deponent and informed him that he had been to the jail, and that Mr. Hall, the jailer, was not at home, and that Mrs. Hall was not acquainted with him, Lawson, and was not willing to let Morgan go on his application, that he had asked her if she would discharge him provided this deponent would come to the jail and say it was proper, and that she said on that condition she would let him go. And the said Lawson requested this deponent to go to the jail for that purpose. And this deponent believing the statement of the said Lawson to be true, did accompany him to the jail for the purpose above expressed, and for no other, and at the jail stated to Mrs. Hall that in his opinion there would be no harm in discharging Morgan, provided the debt for which he was committed was paid. And this deponent further says, that he verily believed, that the said Morgan was voluntarily going away with Lawson. And this deponent had no knowledge or intimation of any design or intention on the part of anyone to use any force or violence in carrying away Morgan, 
nor should this deponent have gone to the jail aforesaid except on the solicitation above mentioned. And this deponent further says, that when Morgan came to the outer door of the jail and had descended the steps, to the great surprise of this deponent, he, Morgan, as appeared from his exclamations, made resistance, and was taken down the street east from the jail, but what kind of resistance he made, or what force was used to compel him to go, this deponent does not know, for he was not near enough to Morgan at any time after he came out of the jail to see or know what was done to him. But this deponent freely and without any reserve acknowledges that he was near enough to hear the noise, and might have interfered to endeavor to prevent any abuse of Morgan, and that he did follow at a distance of some rods behind Morgan and, and the persons with him, until the carriage came up, and he, Morgan, and the persons with him, got into the carriage. And this deponent then verily believed, and still does believe, that Morgan got into the carriage without any force whatever. And this deponent was at no time nearer than within several rods of Morgan on that evening before he got into the carriage. And this deponent further says, that this omission to interfere and assist Morgan, was the first and only act or omission of this deponent in which he is conscious of having been guilty of any criminal or improper conduct, or participation in the matters contained in the indictment in this case. And this deponent says, that he was taken wholly by surprise, and had no time for reflection, that he did not expect, and had no reason to expect, any such occurrence, and he did sincerely and deeply regret that he had been guilty of any such improper conduct as soon as he saw what had been done, and he still does with deep and unfeigned regret acknowledge and lament the part which he so took in said transaction. And this deponent further says, that at the time aforesaid he understood and believed, that Morgan was voluntarily going away with Lawson to some place in this or the adjoining county, but to what place he did not know, for the purpose of being out of the reach and influence of David C. Miller, who, as this deponent was informed, was engaged with said Morgan in publishing a book, which, as this deponent considered, would be calculated to bring the institutions of masonry into disrepute, by professing to reveal secrets which he was bound by solemn obligations not to disclose. And this deponent was desirous to prevent the publication of such book, provided Morgan could be persuaded to keep out of the way of said Miller, and not to permit himself to be influenced by him or his friends, and it was with this view, and no other, that this deponent was desirous to have Morgan depart with Lawson. And this deponent further says, that he has never seen Morgan since he got into the carriage as aforesaid, nor does he know where he is at present, nor has he known anything of him since the time he so got into the carriage. And this deponent further says, that in going down the street, after Morgan and those with him had passed from the jail, he met a man who was, as he supposed, a Mr. Osborne, who asked this deponent what was the matter, to which this deponent replied, that a man had been released from jail, and he believed they had another precept for him, or words to that effect. And this deponent also picked up a hat which he found in the street there. And this deponent further says, that the foregoing is a true and impartial account of all the participation of this deponent in the matters contained in the said indictment, and of the motives which influenced him in the same, according to the best of his knowledge and belief. And this deponent further says, that an action of assault and battery and false imprisonment has been commenced in the Supreme Court of the State of New York, in the name of William Morgan, plaintiff, against this deponent. And this deponent has been arrested on a copious issued in the same, in which the damages are laid at $10,000, and on which this deponent is held to bail in the sum of $1,500, by order of Judge Birdsell. And this deponent further says, that he has a family of four children, and is in moderate circumstances as to property, and the situation of his pecuniary affairs is such as to require his constant and unremitted attention to business to meet the engagements and responsibilities into which he has entered. And this deponent further says, that he never knew, nor has he any reason to believe, that the said John Sheldon, the above-named defendant, had any part or concern whatever, either directly or indirectly, in any of the transactions above referred to. And this deponent has been well acquainted with the said John Sheldon for several years. And further this deponent says not. Edward Sawyer. Sworn, and subscribed this 6th day of January, A. D. 1827, before me, Ralph Lester, Clerk of Ontario County. Number 10. Ontario County, S.S. Lowton Lawson, being duly sworn, says that he has no knowledge of any agency or participation by John Sheldon in the matter or acts charged in the foregoing entitled indictment, that he never had any conversation with him in relation thereto before said Sheldon was arrested on said charge, 
that he does not know, or believe, that said John Sheldon was at Batavia in the month of September last. Lowton Lawson. Sworn this 6th day of January, 1827, before me, Geoffrey Chipman, Commissioner, etc. Number 11. The following is the address of Judge Throop, upon his sentencing the prisoners. You have been convicted of a daring, wicked, and presumptuous crime, such an one as we did hope would not, in our day, have polluted this land. You have robbed the state of a citizen, a citizen of his liberty, a wife of her husband, and a family of helpless children of the endearments and protecting care of a parent. And whether the unfortunate victim of your rage has been immolated, or is in the land of the living, we are ignorant, and even you do not pretend to know. It is admitted in this case, and stands proved, that Morgan was, by a hypocritical pretense of friendship and charity, and that, too, in the imposing shape of pecuniary relief to a distressed and poverty-bound prisoner, beguiled to entrust himself to one of your number, who seized him, as soon as a confederate arrived to his aid, almost at his prison door, and in the night time hurried him into a carriage, and forcibly transported him out of the state. But, great as are the individual wrongs of which you inflicted on these helpless and wretched human beings, they are not the heaviest part of your crime. You have disturbed the public peace, you have dared to raise your parricidal arms against the laws and constitution of your government, you have assumed a power which is incompatible with a due subordination to the laws and public authority of your state. He was a citizen, under the protection of our laws, you were citizens, and owed obedience to them. What hardihood and wickedness then prompted you to steal your hearts against the claims of humanity, and to dare set at defiance those laws to which you owed submission, and which cannot suffer a citizen's liberty to be restrained with impunity, without violating its duties of protection assured to every individual under the social compact. Will you plead ignorance? Some of you, at least, have had the advantage of education, and moral instruction, and hold respectable and responsible stations in society, and all of you have learned what every schoolboy in this happy land, this free and intelligent community, knows, that the unrestrained enjoyment of life, liberty, and property, is guaranteed to every individual upon living obediently under our laws. Our constitution shows it, and the declaration of our independence declares, that the unmolested enjoyment of liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, are the unalienable rights of man. So sacred do we hold personal liberty, that even the impressment of a seaman from one of our ships, has been considered a sufficient cause for national war, man here is not like men in other countries, a submissive vassal, but every citizen is a sovereign, and I am happy to say that here he possesses that intelligence and high sense of feeling which befits his elevated station. Our laws will resent such attacks as you have made their sovereignty. Your conduct has created, in the people of this section of the country, a strong feeling of virtuous indignation. The court rejoices to witness it, to be made sure that a citizen's person cannot be invaded by lawless violence, without its being felt by every individual in the community. It is a blessed spirit, and we do hope that it will not subside, that it will be accompanied by a ceaseless vigilance, and untiring activity, until every actor in this profligate conspiracy is hunted from his hiding place and brought before the tribunals of the country to receive the punishment merited by his crime. We think that we see in this public sensation the spirit which brought us into existence as a nation, and a pledge that our rights and liberties are destined to endure. But this is not all, your offence was not the result of passion suddenly excited, nor the deed of one individual. It was preconcerted, deliberated upon, and carried into effect, by the dictates of the secret councils and conclave of many actors. It takes its deepest hues of guilt from a conspiracy, a crime most dreaded, from the depravity of heart it evinces, the power for unlawful purposes which it combines, and from its ability to defy the power of the law, and ultimate danger to the public peace. Hence it is, that the crime is considered full, when the wicked purpose is proved to have been formed, and the subsequent carrying into effect the object of the conspiracy, does not, in the eye of the law, elevate the degree of the crime. The legislature have not seen fit, perhaps, from the supposed improbability that the crime would be attempted, to make your offence a felony. Its grade and punishment has been left to the provisions of the common law, which treats it as a misdemeanor, and punishes it with fine and imprisonment in the common jail. The court are of opinion that your liberty ought to be made to answer for the liberty of Morgan, his person was restrained by force, and the court, in the exercise of its lawful powers, ought not to be more tender of your liberty, than you, in the plentitude of lawless force, were of his. With regard to you, 
Lawson, it appeared, in proof, that you was an active agent in this affair, you went forward and took this man from the jail, and delivered him over to those who stood waiting with a carriage to receive him. Whether you accompanied that Cariago or not, is not in proof. But in your excusatory affidavit you say nothing about it, leaving it to fair inference that you did accompany him in that carriage. There is nothing, either in your affidavit, or your proof to the court, which does much to mitigate your offence, except so far as they show that your poverty has not been accompanied by idleness, and your character has not been stained by other transgressions. Under all the circumstances of your case, the court feel it their duty to sentence you to two years' imprisonment in the common jail of this county. As to you, Casebro, it appears, by your affidavit, that you did not lay your hands upon this man, to carry into effect the conspiracy, and it appears by unquestionable proof that you did not leave this village with the carriage. But you admit, at least tacitly, in your affidavit, that you were one of the conspirators, and your language to the jailer, when he called upon you the next day to account for your conduct, and warned you that the public would demand an explanation, showed an unsubdued spirit. It has been satisfactorily proved to us that you are a thriving mechanic, that you have a respectable standing in the community, and up to the period of this transaction your character for industry, honesty, quiet and moral deportment, was without reproach. Under the circumstances of your case, the court sentenced you to one year imprisonment in the common jail of this county. As to you, Sawyer, your affidavit, which, from the uniform good character you have proved, we fully believe to be true, states, that you had no knowledge of this conspiracy, and took no active part in it. But your accompanying Lawson, at his request, to the jail, to inform the jailer's wife that she would be safe in receiving the amount of Morgan's debt from Lawson and letting him go, with the other circumstances, were sufficient to have convicted you, if you had stood trial, and you acted wisely in pleading guilty. You state that you had no idea that he was under restraint, until you saw him enter the carriage, a short distance from you, and you did not suspect that he was forced into it, until, in the progress of your walk, you picked up his hat, that you were then surprised and confounded, and did not therefore give the alarm, but you spent the rest of the evening at a public house, and gave no intimation of what you had seen. This, then, was your offence, you should have given the alarm, you should raise the hue and cry, and endeavoured to effect a rescue. You, however, expressed in your affidavit, and have always evinced, a feeling of remorse. The court, therefore, sentence you to one month imprisonment in the common jail of this county. As to you, Sheldon, you denied any participation in the conspiracy, and put yourself upon trial. As to all the acts proved against you, there was mystery, and I doubt whether you were the man. You were at the time confined on the limits of the jail, you were most strongly identified in an appearance at Batavia, and although your proof of an alibi was not complete, there was much in it to shake our faith in the fact that you were the mysterious stranger whom the witness saw, your confessions of guilt, however, were clear and indisputable, and fully warranted the verdict, and the only explanation of them you offered was the ungracious. 1. That your confessions were the vainglorious boastings of a drunkard and a liar. Taking all things into consideration, the court have adjudged you to three months imprisonment in the common jail of the county. Number 12. To the public. On the 11th day of September, William Morgan, a native of Virginia, who had for about three years past resided in this village, was under pretext of a justice's warrant hurried from his home and family and carried to Canandaigua. The same night he was examined on the charge of petty larceny, and discharged by the justice. One of the persons who took him away immediately obtained a warrant against him, in a civil suit, for an alleged debt of two dollars, on which he was committed to the jail of Ontario County. On the night of the 12th of September he was released by a person pretending to be his friend, but directly in front of the jail, notwithstanding his cries of murder, he was gagged and secured and put into a carriage, and after travelling all night, he was left, as the driver of the carriage says, at Hanford's Landing, about sunrise on the 13th, since which he has not been heard of. His distressed wife and two infant children are left dependent on charity for their sustenance. The circumstances of the transaction have given rise to the most violent fears that he has been murdered. It is however hoped by his wife and friends, that he may be now kept concealed and imprisoned in Canada. All persons who are willing to serve the cause of humanity, and assist to remove the distressing apprehensions of his unfortunate wife, are earnestly requested to communicate to one of the committee named below, 
directed to this place, any facts or circumstances which have come to their knowledge, and are calculated to lead to the discovery of his present situation, or the particulars of his fate, if he has been murdered. Batavia, October 4th. Committee. T. F. Talbot, D. E. Evans, T. Carey, W. M. Keyes, W. M. Davis, John. Lay, T. Fitch, L. D. Prindle, E. Southworth, Jass. P. Smith. N. B. It is hoped that printers throughout the state, in Canada, and elsewhere, will give the above a few insertions, and thus serve the cause of justice and humanity. Number 13. State of New York, Genesee County, S.S. John K. Larkin, of the town of Byron, in said county, being duly sworn, deposeth and saith, that on the morning that William Morgan was carried off from the village of Batavia, he, this deponent, went to Andrew Adams to borrow a saddle, before the said deponent had got far off, said Adams called to him and said he must have his soul day, for he, Adams, was notified to attend a special meeting of the Masons at Leroy, at ten o'clock, same morning, Adams also understood to be a Freemason. And this deponent asked Dr. Taylor what the fuss was, to which Dr. Taylor replied, they, the Masons, had orders from the Grand Lodge to notify a special meeting. And this deponent further saith not. John K. Larkin, subscribed and sworn to this ninth day of March, 1827, before me, Andrew Dibble, J. P. Copy, State of New York, Genesee County, S.S. John Southworth and Luther will dare, of the town of Byron, in said county, being duly sworn, depose and say, that some time after the abduction of William Morgan from the village of Batavia, in the month of September last, they, the deponents, with others, had a conversation with Dr. Samuel Taggart of said town, who is reputed and understood to be a Freemason, about the carrying off said Morgan, in which Dr. Taggart said there had been a rumpus at Batavia, that Morgan was taken away, and Miller's office. Meaning as the deponents understood, the printing office of David C. Miller, a printer, in Batavia, had been set on fire, and on some person present saying he had not heard anything of the affair, Dr. Taggart said he had known it for a length of time. Dr. Taggart further stated that he should not be afraid to bet a thousand dollars that Morgan was not in the land of the living, that he had taken a voyage on Lake Ontario without float or boat, and would never be seen again by any human being. And further saith not. John Southworth, Luther Wilder, subscribed and sworn to, this ninth day of March, 1827, before me, Andrew Dibble, J. P. Copy, State of New York, Genesee County, S.S. Elias Wilder, of the town of Elba, in said county, being duly sworn, deposeth and saith, that about two or three weeks before William Morgan was carried from Batavia, he, this deponent, had a conversation with one Cyrus Grout, whom this deponent understands and verily believes to be a Freemason, on the subject of said Morgan's attempt, to publish the secrets of Masonry, and that the said Cyrus Grout told this deponent, that the Masons had sent to the Grand Lodge for instructions. And when they got word from them, meaning said Grand Lodge, as this deponent understood, there would be something done. And this deponent further saith, that after the abduction of said Morgan, he, this deponent, had another conversation with said Cyrus Grout, and others, on the subject of what had become of said Morgan, and Grout said he, Morgan, was gone a-fishing on the Niagara River of Lake Ontario. And further saith not. Elias Wilder, subscribed and sworn to, this ninth day of March, 1827, before me, Andrew Dibble, J. P., number 14. Genesee County, S.S. Lyman D. Prindle, being duly sworn, saith, that on the fourth day of October last he met with James Ganson at Rochester, who beckoned to him to come to him, Ganson, he entered into conversation with him, this deponent, relating to the disturbances at Batavia, about the taking away of William Morgan. This deponent expressed his opinion that he could have rescued Morgan if he had known it. Ganson said, let me tell you, you know nothing about it. Suppose there had been carriages ready at every road leading into Canandaigua ready to receive Morgan, in case he had been pursued he could have been shifted, and let me tell you it was the case, or let me tell you it is likely that was the case. Let me tell you, if you could hang, draw, and quarter, or gibbet the masons, them that has a hand in it, it would not fetch Morgan back. He is not dead, 
but he is put where he will stay put until God Almighty calls for him. And further saith not. Lyman D. Prindle. Sworn the 11th day of October, 1826, before me, C. Carpenter, J. P. No. 15. Letter from George Ketchum to Mrs. Morgan. Rochester, September 14, 1826. Mrs. Morgan, make yourself contented, I have learned your husband is well, but cannot learn where or which way he went, when I can learn, I will give you the earliest information. Be faithful to what I said to you, and you will find friends, keep your own counsel, and communicate to me through the post office. When I write to you it will be handed to you by the person I deliver it to, you must not pass a word with him, but write all the information you can obtain by following what I advised. If you want money, write to me, and I will send it. Commit this to the flames as soon as you read it, your friend, you have the name on a small paper I gave you. N. B. A line was run through the postscript as above, but the words are perfectly legible. Number 16. Genesee County, S.S. John Mann, of Buffalo, blacksmith by trade, deposeth and saith, that in the latter part of August last, or early in September, and very shortly before he heard that an attempt had been made to burn the printing office of David C. Miller, at Batavia, he was riding with one Richard Howard, of Buffalo, a bookbinder, who then worked with Mr. Haskins, and in the course of the ride he, said Howard, asked opponent to purchase or procure a keg of spirits of turpentine, as he thinks, saying he wanted to switch Miller's office with it, avowing at the same time his object to be to destroy the building for the purpose of suppressing a publication, which he said Morgan and Miller were about making, relating to Freemasonry. This deponent declined to assist in the act, intimating to him, as he believes, that he had no money to do it with. After he heard that such attempt had been made on the office of Miller, said Howard told this deponent that he had, with others who aided and assisted him, attempted to burn said office, that he had called at a store west of Batavia and bought a broom or brush to spread the turpentine with, and with his dark lanthorn had set fire to it, that the fire was lighted up, and he ran off, that some person ran after him, and he supposed was about to overtake him. When he turned and dashed his dark lanthorn into his face, which stopped the pursuit. That upon reflection since he concluded that it was a friend who ran after him, but had never found out. He believed then, and still does believe, that said Howard's object was to implicate him in the transaction. John Mann. Sworn the 21st day of February, 1827, before me, W.M. H. Tisdale, first judge of Genesee. Number 17. State of New York, Genesee County, S.S. Thomas G. Green, late of the town of Henrietta, in the county of Monroe, and state aforesaid, Carpenter, being duly sworn, deposeth and saith, that during the summer and until November in the fall of the year 1826, this deponent resided in the village of Buffalo. Sometime between the 20th day of August and the 7th day of September last, he, this deponent, was requested by Richard Howard of Buffalo, aforesaid, to attend the lodge of Freemasons in that place, but Howard did not state to this deponent for what purpose the lodge was requested to meet, said there would be but a few there. In the evening this deponent started to go to the lodge, and on the way fell in with said Howard and went to the lodge with him. After the lodge was organized and had proceeded to business, it being then understood that William Morgan and David C. Miller, of Batavia, were about to publish at that place a book purporting to be a disclosure of Masonic secrets. This deponent was in the chair and presided for the time. Howard proposed that something should be done to prevent the publication of said book. B. Wilcox, of Buffalo, who was present, opposed the use of any rash or violent means for that purpose. Wilcox wished to know what measures it was intended should be adopted. Howard proposed that he and one other person, not now recollected by this deponent, should be a committee to attend to the business, and that they should be left to use such measures as they should think proper, so that the book should be suppressed. Wilcox proposed that they should be restricted from the use of any violent measures, and it was so concluded at that time that no rash or violent measures should be used, to suppress the book. A short time afterwards Howard requested that this deponent should go to the lodge room with him that evening, that a few were to meet there. In the evening this deponent started to go to the lodge room, and on the way fell in with Howard, but did not go to the lodge room. They walked together as far as the Franklin House, 
thence to the terrace back of the village, where Howard and this deponent had the following conversation, Howard asked this deponent if he was willing to aid him in suppressing the book above alluded to. This deponent said he was willing to assist as far as was reasonable and proper, or according to what was proposed by Wilcox. Howard said he wanted a decisive answer one way or the other, he wanted to know whether he, this deponent, was for them, the Masons, as this deponent supposed, or against them. This deponent said he was for them, and was willing to aid in suppressing the book if it were to promote the interests of the Masonic institution, and asked Howard what plan he intended to pursue. Howard said they intended to go to Batavia and get the papers, which this deponent understood to mean the manuscript papers of the book, and they were to get them peaceably if they could, if not, by force, and if they could not get them without, they would take Morgan and Miller, and carry them off too. This deponent finally consented to join the party and go to Batavia, for the purpose of getting the papers as aforesaid. The time for this expedition was not agreed upon at this time, but Howard afterwards informed this deponent that it was arranged to be in Batavia for the above purpose on the Friday evening following, being the 8th day of September last. This deponent does not recollect how many were going from Buffalo. This deponent accordingly got into the stage at Buffalo on Thursday evening, the 7th of September, for Batavia, and arrived in Batavia on Friday morning. During the day this deponent remained in and about Batavia, but conversed with none on the subject of his being at that place, except James B. Tosley, to whom he communicated the plan of attacking Miller's office. In the early part of the evening this deponent was informed that Tosley had told George W. Harris of the contemplated attack upon Miller's office, and that this deponent was the author of this information. This threw many obstructions in the way of the expedition, and was a principal cause of its total failure, and for which Howard blamed this deponent. In the evening a number of men were assembled in the village of Batavia, how many this deponent cannot say, there might have been forty or fifty, and perhaps more, but they were mostly strangers to this deponent, nor did he know where they came from. This deponent understood from some of them that it was expected that there would have been twenty-five from Fort George and its vicinity, but, as he understood, they did not come. Eight or ten were put under the immediate direction of this deponent, and the remainder were in different parts of the village, and directed by different persons. The whole party did not get into the village till nearly two o'clock in the morning of Saturday, and they remained about two hours until the western stage came in, when the whole company dispersed in different directions. This was about four o'clock in the morning. During the time they were in the village no attack was made upon Miller's office. It was understood that Miller and Morgan, in consequence of the information communicated to them by way of Tosley, had been alarmed, and were on the watch, which caused some consultation and consequent delay, until the stage came in. When the party dispersed, this deponent made his best way to Buffalo, went west to the Brick Tavern, about fourteen miles, then south to what is called the South Pembroke Road, and pursued his way to Monroe's Tavern, about five miles from Buffalo. At this place this deponent saw Colonel Joseph Shure, who spoke to this deponent, and asked him what he was doing there, this deponent then took Shaw one side and requested that he would not call him, this deponent, by name again, or mention to any one that he had seen him at that place, for he, this deponent, had been in a bad scrape, and wished him not to speak of it. Shaw asked this deponent what it was, but this deponent refused to tell him, but said he would at some future time, and that Shaw would hear about it. From this place this deponent went to Buffalo, where he arrived the same evening. And this deponent further saith, that he has never been personally concerned otherwise than above stated, in any measures to suppress the publication of the book, or for the carrying away or disposing of Morgan. And further saith not. Thomas G. Green. Subscribed and sworn to, this 16th day of July, 1827, before me, C. Carpenter, one of the justices of the peace in and for Genesee County. Number 19. Niagara County. S.S. David Maxwell, being sworn, saith that in the night of the thirteenth day of September last he was at home attending to the keeping of the turnpike gate on the Ridge Road, so called, about nineteen miles distant from Lewiston. About eleven o'clock, p.m. he was sitting in the toll house and heard a carriage pass through the gate very slowly, and upon opening the door he saw Jeremiah Brown, of Ridgeway, standing directly in front of the door, and saw the carriage standing in the road, about three rods west of the house. He, Brown, had a shilling in his hand, which he handed to him, 
being the exact amount of the toll on the carriage. The opponent said, How do you do, Captain Brown? He made no answer and turned away quickly and went towards the carriage. The opponent called to him quite loudly, and said, What is the matter? Brown answered, Nothing. The opponent took notice of the carriage because he had never known Brown to have anything to do with a coach before, and it struck him as a thing out of the usual course. He thinks the curtains were closed. Brown joined the carriage, but whether he got into it, or got on the driver's seat, the opponent cannot say. The carriage drove off quickly, when the opponent entered into the house, himself and his wife had a conversation, and expressed to each other their wonder as to the course that should take Captain Brown west with a coach so late at night. He, Brown, is a farmer, in good circumstances, residing about 13 miles east of the gate, and well known to deponent and his wife, and passing the gate frequently, and never to the knowledge and recollection of deponent with any other carriage than a common two-horse farm wagon. They eventually concluded that he perhaps had gone on to Lewiston to an installation. The next morning before breakfast, and not far from sunrise, the same carriage, as he thinks, arrived at the gate, driven by a person he did not then know. The middle curtains were then up, and deponent distinctly saw the said Jeremiah Brown sitting on the back seat of the carriage, appearing to be asleep and leaning back, he saw no other person in the carriage. Deponent said to the driver, how far did you go out, did you go to Lewiston? He hesitated a little and said, no, we did not go to Lewiston. The deponent and his wife then observed to each other, that they had not gone to the installation. Deponent took notice that the coach was a chocolate color, it appeared to be a hack carriage that had been much used. David Maxwell, sworn the 22nd day of March, 1827, before me, Daniel Seaman, J. P. No. 20. Niagara County, S.S. Paul Mosher, of Lewiston, in said county, being duly sworn, doth on his oath declare that previous to the month of December last past this deponent had been in the employ of the stage proprietors at Lewiston, his special business being to regulate and superintend the arrival and departure of the stages, for more than one year. That while in such employ, on the morning of the 14th day of September last, about four o'clock, a. m., one of the drivers informed him, that he had just returned from Youngstown. This driver was Corydon Fox, who further stated that Samuel Barton, one of the stage proprietors, had called him time that night, and directed him to get up a carriage and drive it to Youngstown. Fox also stated that Eli Bruce, sheriff of Niagara County, or as he called him, Bruce, came with Mr. Barton, when he was called up, that after the getting the carriage ready, Bruce told him, Fox, to drive round to a back street. He did so, and found a carriage in the street without horses, that there was something curious about it, he thought there was a man in the carriage who was gagged and bound. That there were two persons who came up out of the carriage standing in the street, and both, with Bruce, got into the one he was driving. Bruce told him to go or drive on, he was directed to stop at the residence of Colonel King. He halted accordingly in front of the door or house at Youngstown. Bruce got out and called up King. Bruce and King both got into the carriage. That he heard a man in the carriage call for water, and Bruce said he should have some, he also thought he heard King say, Morgan, are you here? That he, Fox, was directed to drive on, and when about halfway from Youngstown to the fort, Bruce told him to stop, he did so, and they all got out, and he returned to Lewiston. Fox has more recently stated that it was near the graveyard where he stopped. This deponent thinking it strange that passengers should leave the carriage distant from a house, in the night, was led to inquire of a mason present, this deponent being also one, the reason of it, he answered that he believed it was Morgan. The deponent inquired of another mason, and was told it was Morgan, for Bruce told him so. In the forenoon of the same day, 14th September, the deponent saw Bruce and asked why he was so imprudent as to have the driver he did, for he was not a mason, to which Bruce replied that Sam, meaning Samuel Barton, was more in the fault than himself, for he told him to send a mason. The deponent then asked Bruce if he actually had Morgan, he said he had. And the conversation ended here. Samuel Barton asked this deponent the same day if Fox mistrusted Morgan was in the carriage, the deponent told him that Fox was telling about the village the circumstances of his having driven the carriage, etc., which led this deponent to believe and probably would others, that it was Morgan.
Barton then told that opponent to go and say to Fox that if he knew anything to keep it to himself and hold his tongue, or he would discharge him, and further stated that there must be another man smuggled away to blind that transaction, he further said that the opponent being a mason, was the man who ought to have been sent as driver, but being called up in the night in a hurry, he did not think. In the afternoon of the same day said Barton came to the deponent, and directed him to borrow a saddle and bridle and put them on a horse as soon as possible, and hitch it by another horse, standing under the shed, pointing that way, and which horse appeared as if he had been rode fast, he added that he had heard from the fort, and must send a man down, for he was afraid there would be trouble yet. He did as directed, and the two horses were rode off soon after, the one put there by this deponent, by a mason resident in Lewiston, the other by a person not known to this deponent. Next morning the deponent, asked said Barton if there was any trouble at the fort, to which he replied, I guess it is still enough. Fox, the driver before mentioned, within, say three or four weeks afterwards, joined the lodge in Lewiston, at a special meeting called for that purpose, and on being solicited so to do by a mason who was sent to Fox to induce him to join, and who, pursuant to instructions, told Fox that if he wanted funds, meaning for his admittance, he should have them. This deponent further saith, that in relating the above facts and circumstances which he heard from several individuals at different times and places, he has not pretended to give the exact words in all cases, but verily believes the substance is truly and correctly set forth. And further saith not. Paul Mosher. Subscribed and sworn to, at Youngstown, Niagara County, the 22nd of March, 1827, before me. A. G. Hinman, J. P. No. 21. State of New York. Niagara County, S.S. Josiah Trion, of said county, being sworn, saith, that on the evening of the 14th of September last past he attended a dance or ball at Lewiston, there having been on that day a considerable collection of ladies and gentlemen at Lewiston on the occasion, of what was called the installation of a chapter, so called, that at the same ball were present a Mr. Edwin Scrantum, a friend of deponents, who wished to leave town in time to get on board of the steamboat for York, you, C, and to induce him to remain at the ball, this deponent had promised to take him there, as soon as the ball closed, he would start right off with him to Youngstown, that he might be in time for the boat. Accordingly he started from Lewiston with his friend in a one-horse wagon. That the night was clear, and the moon was remarkably bright. That about two miles from Lewiston, he met five men walking towards Lewiston, of whom he then distinctly recognized and believed to be Timothy Shaw, Samuel Chebuck, and General Parkhurst Whitney, who keeps what it is called the Eagle Hotel, at the Falls of Niagara, and he has since been informed, and has ascertained to his own perfect satisfaction, that the other two were James L. Barton, of Black Rock, and Noah Beach, of Lewiston. It was, as he thinks, between the hours of three and four of the clock, in the morning of the 15th of said September. The opponent drew up his horse, and said to one of them who were a little behind the rest, what are you here this time of night for question mark or words to that purport? He answered, as I think, we have had a set down at Youngstown and passed on. That this deponent mentioned the circumstances to others in the village of Lewiston, and the story soon enlarged by report, so as to implicate the above-named men in the extraordinary disappearance of William Morgan. And three of them have had conversation with him in relation thereto, and one of them requested him to correct erroneous reports of what he had said but in none of those conversations did either of them attempt to say where they had spent the night, or how it happened that they were on their way to Lewiston on foot at that time of the morning. He further says, that all of the said men are men having families, and following business with ordinary regularity, and of ordinary good habits. He further says, that according to his recollection and belief, none of the above-named persons have given to him any explanation of the above circumstances. Josiah Trion sworn the 22nd day of March, 1827, before me. A. G. Hinman, J. P. No. 23. Niagara County, S. S. I. A. G. E. Hinman, one of the justices of the peace of said county, do hereby certify, that on the 29th of last December, compliant was made on oath before me, setting forth in substance that there was full cause to suspect that Eli Bruce, sheriff of the said county, had, on or about the 13th or 14th of last September, forcibly and without due process of law, held William Morgan in duress for some time, within the said county, 
and had secretly and illegally conveyed him thence to parts unknown. Whereupon I issued a warrant against the said Eli Bruce, who was brought before me, for examination, on the 30th of said December. And I do further certify that the information taken on such examination was substantially as follows, to wit, that the said Eli Bruce came to Molyneux's Tavern, about twelve miles east of Lewiston, on the Ridge Road, on the night of the 13th of said September, at about ten or eleven o'clock, in a hack or coach, the curtains of which were closed quite around. He went in and inquired for the landlord, who was in bed, was shown into his room, afterwards called up the landlord's son, who was also in bed, and requested him to put a pair of horses before his carriage, to relieve those that came with it, to go as far as Lewiston, which was done. The son asked if he should drive, Bruce replied he had a driver who was a careful man, pointing to a man whom the witness knew to be Jeremiah Brown. Bruce was also asked by a hired girl, what the matter was, he answered, you cannot know at present. He soon left there with the carriage, driven by Brown towards Lewiston. At Lewiston the same night, but the hour not ascertained, the said Bruce went with Samuel Barton, a stage proprietor, to the stage office to ascertain what driver could be had to go to Youngstown. On being informed by Joshua Fairbanks who slept there, that none but Fox was there, Fox was called up and directed to harness a carriage, which he did, and drove up to the frontier house, where said Bruce got in, and ordered the carriage driven to a back street. On arriving there, in front of said Barton's dwelling house, a carriage was found in the street without any horses attached to it, and two men, either one or both of whom were in it, got out, and went into the other, one was helped in by the arm, nothing was said. When, together with said Bruce, being seated, the driver was ordered by Bruce to drive to Youngstown. Witness heard no conversation from the passengers that he could distinguish. On arriving at Youngstown, Bruce directed him to stop in front of Colonel King's house in Youngstown. He did so, and Bruce got out and called up Colonel King, went in, and in a few minutes, say fifteen, came out, together with King, and both got into the carriage, when Bruce told the driver to go on. While at this house the driver heard a strange kind of sound from one of the persons in the carriage, which thought was a call for water, though he could not say that the articulation was sufficiently distinct to be understood, Bruce answered he should have had some presently, none was, however, given or brought. The carriage proceeded to within a short distance of Fort Niagara, near the graveyard, when the driver was directed to stop, and the persons within, four in number, he thought, got out, one was assisted as before, and they proceeded off from the side of the carriage, closely together, towards the fort. Bruce told the driver to go back, and he immediately returned. The next morning, the 14th, the said Eli Bruce being at Lewiston, he was asked if he went to Youngstown the night before, he said he did. He was then asked if he took Morgan down, he replied he did, and observed that Sam, meaning said Barton, was very imprudent in sending Fox, that he told him his business, and that he had not ought to have sent any but a mason. There were five witnesses sworn, whose testimony is included in the above statement. No attempt was made to impeach either of them, nor was there any evidence offered on the part of Mr. Bruce. As there was no proof adduced on this examination, that a William Morgan had been forcibly seized and carried away from Canandaigua, or elsewhere, nor that force, violence, or restraint, had been exercised upon the person of any individual in the carriage, the said Bruce was discharged. Given under my hand, at Youngstown, in the said county, the 21st day of March, 1827, A. G. Hinman, J. P. No. 24. State of New York, Niagara, County, S. S. William Terry, of Niagara, Province of Upper Canada, Druggist, being, duly sworn, doth depose and say, that in the month of September or October last, this deponent was in ill health and confined to his dwelling, and had been so some time. That about this time a neighbor of this deponent informed him that a man had engaged, in some part of the state of New York, in publishing a book concerning masonry, or disclosing the secrets of masonry, or words to that effect. This deponent does not recollect the name mentioned at this time by his informant, but has now no doubt that it related to the abduction of William Morgan. This deponent was further informed at the same time, by the same person, that the person so taken and carried away had been killed, and sunk in Lake Ontario. This deponent's informant was of the fraternity of Freemasons, as is also this deponent, which this deponent believes was the reason why this story was related to him. 
that this deponent at the time disbelieved the facts related, and told his informant that it could not be possible, but was assured it was a fact, and said he, the informant, would relate more about it at another time. Some few weeks afterwards, when this deponent was recovering, the same informant added, or further related, that Morgan had been brought to Fort Niagara, or to the other side of the river opposite this, meaning the town of Niagara, and was there put to death. This deponent again expressed doubts of the truth of the relation, and expressed himself in warm terms of disapprobation, denying the right of the Society of Masons, or any members of the fraternity, to commit such a deed. The relator was, however, of a different opinion, and said it was right. Sometime in the month of December last, this deponent was further informed by another member of the society aforesaid, who also resides in the same town with this deponent, that Morgan had been taken at Batavia, was brought to Fort Niagara, and from thence to the town of Niagara, and was taken before another mason of the same place, that the masons in Canada refused to receive Morgan, or to have anything to do with him, and that Morgan was returned to Fort Niagara, that after. Morgan was tried by some sort of a council, or tribunal, which sentenced him to death, that he was executed by having his throat cut, his tongue was torn out, and buried in the sands of the lakes or lake, and that his body was also sunk in the lake or deep water opposite, off, from, or near the fort, which is as near the substance of what was said as this deponent can recollect. The relator further added that Morgan did not know where he was, that he was blinded, that the boat was rowed about the river for the purpose of deranging the man, that while at Fort Niagara, Morgan asked permission of a Bible, and a short time in the light, in order that he might peruse it. This deponent asked what was the result of the request, to which the relator added, that he was soon dispatched. This deponent asked how those who had been engaged in the affair felt about it, the relator observed that they felt bad, and some had expressed so much contrition as to say that they would have given all they were worth if the affair had not happened, or if Morgan could be produced again. And this deponent further saith, that the relator added that one of the persons concerned was sick and delirious in consequence of it, and had to have watches, according to the best belief of this deponent. Further, the relator stated that those engaged at Canandaigua, and there indicted, were to be kept harmless by the general grand chapter of the state of New York, and that all expense requisite to pay any fines that might be imposed was to be defrayed by the said chapter, and that the actors in the affair of the abduction of Morgan so acted in obedience to the order, or by the consent or knowledge, or directions, of the said grand chapter. The relator also stated that it was the intention of those who had Morgan to have taken Miller also. This deponent, at the time he heard the last relation, did believe the substantial part of it, and still does most firmly believe it. This deponent further saith, that another member of the Masonic Society also related the same facts substantially, and said he derived his information from a gentleman of Buffalo, a Mason, now deceased. This latter part is intended to be restricted to the fact of the death of Morgan, and the place of depositing the body. This deponent further saith, that the foregoing was prepared and signed, though not sworn to, some time since. Subsequent to that period further information has been received by this deponent, which has induced him to believe that the manner of putting Morgan to death was different from the relation of stocking. William Terry. Sworn before me, at Niagara, Upper Canada, this 20th day of March, 1827, J. B. Clench, J. P. No. 25. Genesee County, S.S. John Mann, being sworn, deposeth and saith, that about the time that he heard and understood that William Morgan had been taken away from Batavia, he had a conversation with Richard Howard, of Buffalo, bookbinder, who works, or did work, with Mr. Haskins, who then informed this deponent that Morgan was confined in Fort Niagara. And he believes, in the same conversation with said Howard, he informed him that five persons had drawn lots to see who it would fall upon to execute the laws of masonry upon Morgan, that the lot fell upon him. He seemed much distressed, and clasped his hands together and exclaimed, My God! Must it be done? Or some words to that effect. He appeared to be under an impression that his Masonic obligations placed him under a necessity of submitting to do an act which seemed abhorrent to his natural feelings. In subsequent conversations, said Howard gave this deponent to understand that the execution had been performed, but said nothing more as to his own agency in the transaction. This deponent further saith, that until within a few days past his mind has been very unsettled as to the course which he ought to have pursued in relation to the communications so made to him, and he has been operated upon in some degree by fears for his personal safety, 
and doubts as to the extent of his obligations to observe secrecy in respect to the statements so communicated to him. That a few days ago he held a consultation with a friend, as to the general duties of a person so situated, and he at last determined to communicate the facts to some person who might feel bound to act upon them as public good should seem to require. John Mann. Sworn, the 21st day of February, 1827, before me, William H. Tisdale, 1st Judge of Genesee, Number 26, Niagara County, S.S., Edward Giddens, of the county aforesaid, being duly sworn, saith, that he has resided at Fort Niagara from the year 1815 till the present time, with the exception of about eight months. That from the year 16 to the year 20, this deponent had charge of the building, called the magazine, the greater part of the time. That when the United States troops left the fort in the month of May last, this deponent again took charge of the building, and continued so in charge until about the 1st of August, when he gave up the keys to Colonel E. Jewett, who yet retains the care of it. This building stands on the southerly side of the fort, is built of stone, about the height of a common two-story building, and measures about 50 by 30 feet on the ground, is arched over, the side and end walls are about 4 feet thick, the wall over the top is about 8 feet thick, and is considered bomb-proof, covered with a shingle roof. There is but one door, around which there is a small entry, to which there is a door also. There are no windows or apertures in the walls, except a small ventilator for the admission of air, and one small window in each end about ten feet from the ground, they are usually kept closed, and locked on the outside with a padlock, these shutters are made of plank, covered with sheet iron, the floor is laid with plank, pinned to the sleepers with wood pins. That at the time certain persons were at the fort in January last, Colonel Jewett being unwell, this deponent was requested to visit the magazine, which they wished to examine. That on entering and examining the said building, one of the floor planks, supposed to be one and a half inches thick, was observed by some of the committee to have been newly broken, directly on one of the sleepers, and about six feet from one end, and this deponent was inquired of by some of the committee how that plank became broken. This deponent told them he did not know, Father, he has now no recollection of its being broken when he gave up the keys, and believes it was not. This deponent has also been inquired of whether a loose door, which the committee saw in the building, belonged there, or was there, when he gave up possession, to which this deponent answered that it did not belong to the building, nor did he recollect of its being there at the time he surrendered the key. Father, whether it has been usual to admit any liquid within the building, to which this deponent answered that he never admitted any while he had charge, nor was it usual, so far as his knowledge extends, and he should suppose it one of the last things to be admitted to such a place. The chief aim ought to be to keep it dry, the utmost care has always been taken, and the key of the building only entrusted with particular persons. On entering the building it has been usual to remove or leave the shoes at the door, or else draw on woolen socks over them. There is, nearly in the middle of the floor, frame pieces upon which to lay fixed ammunition. The usual arrangement of the boxes, kegs, etc. containing powder, is to place them round the building on the floor, so far distant from the wall as to prevent them contracting dampness, say from one to two feet, unless empty, when they are set next the wall. Edward Giddens. Subscribed and sworn to, at Porter, in the county of Niagara, the 19th day of March, 1827, before me. A. G. Hinman. Number 27. Niagara, U. C. March 3rd, 1827. Gentlemen, on my return from my parliamentary duties at York, I observed in the Albany Observer a letter dated Lewiston, N., Y. January 12, 1827, in which I perceived some indirect allusions to the name of Emma Member of Parliament, to whose house, it is stated, a William Morgan, of Batavia, was brought, blindfolded and tied. Now, gentlemen, I beg leave to declare through the medium of your paper, to your readers and to the world at large, that no such occurrence ever took place, that on the night of the 14th of September, 1826, nor at any other time, was Morgan in my house to my knowledge. And I further declare the said Morgan is to me an utter stranger, except as to report, and I never exchanged a word with the man in my life, and would not know him, from the greatest stranger in existence. In justice to my own reputation, as well as to that of my family and friends, I hereby most solemnly assert the whole statement to be utterly false and unfounded. And further, that I never conversed with the brother of, stocking of Buffalo, 
on the affair of Morgan, as to his abduction, till after the appearance of the letters alluded to in that paper, when I called on him for that purpose, and he then most explicitly declared that he had never given me as his author to doctor, and admitted that I never had the slightest conversation with him on the subject previous. I could add to the foregoing declarations and assertions, my own affidavit, if necessary, as well as that of my family, consisting of three persons, and a worthy and respectable gentleman, and lady who slept that night at my house. I cannot refrain from expressing my belief, before close this letter, that malice, envy, and foul revenge, are at the bottom of the heart of him, whoever he may be, that would thus villainously attempt to assassinate the character of any man in society. I mean to cast no reflection on the characters of the gentleman who formed the committee of vigilance, but on him to whom it justly belongs. And from declarations made even on the bed of death, that he, the doctor, would be revenged of me, for assisting to destroy a den of rogues and coiners, with whom he was implicated, has been his only inducement thus to do. As, gentlemen, I am the only member of Parliament residing in Niagara whose name commences with the letter M, I have come to the conclusion that I am particularly referred to, and beg you will insert in your paper this refutation of the infamous and foul charges. I am, with respect, your obedient servant, E.D.W. Bride, M. P. P. Number 29. L.S. First Proclamation of the Governor. DeWitt Clinton, Governor of the State of New York, to state officers and ministers of justice in the said state, and particularly in the county of Genesee and the neighboring counties, greeting. Whereas information, under oath, has been transmitted to me by Theodore F. Talbot, Esquire and other citizens of the county of Genesee, acting as a committee in behalf of the people of that county, representing that divers outrages and oppressions have been committed on the rights of persons residing in the village of Batavia, and that disturbances have ensued which are injurious, and may prove destructive to peace and good order in that quarter, now, therefore, I enjoin it upon you, and each of you, to pursue all proper and efficient measures for the apprehension of the offenders, and the prevention of future outrages. And I do also request the good citizens of this state to cooperate with the civil authorities in maintaining the ascendancy of law and good order. Second Proclamation of the Governor. Whereas, it has been represented to me that William Morgan, who was unlawfully conveyed from the jail of the County of Ontario sometime in the month of September last, has not been found, and that it might have a beneficial effect in restoring him to his family, and in promoting the detection and punishment of the perpetrators of this violent outrage, if, in addition to the proceedings heretofore adopted by me, a proclamation was issued offering a specific reward for these purposes, now, therefore, in order that the offenders may be brought to condign punishment, and the violated majesty of the laws thereby effectually vindicated, I do hereby offer, in addition to the assurances of compensation heretofore given, a reward of $300 for the discovery of the offenders, and a reward of $100 for the discovery of any and every one of them. To be paid on conviction, and also a further reward of $200 for authentic information of the place where the said William Morgan has been conveyed. And I do enjoin it upon all sheriffs, magistrates, and other officers and ministers of justice, to be vigilant and active in the discharge of their duties on this occasion. L.S. in witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and the privy seal, at the city of Albany, this 26th day of October, Anno Domini 1826. DeWitt Clinton L.S. Third Proclamation of the Governor. Whereas, the measures adopted for the discovery of William Morgan, after his unlawful abduction from Canandaigua in September last, have not been attended with success, and whereas many of the good citizens of this state are under an impression, from the lapse of time and other circumstances, that he has been murdered, now, therefore, to the end that, if living, he may be restored to his family, and if murdered, that the perpetrators may be brought to condign punishment. I have thought fit to issue this proclamation, promising a reward of $1,000 for the discovery of the said William Morgan, if alive, and, if murdered, a reward of $2,000 for the discovery of the offender or offenders, to be paid on conviction and on the certificate of the Attorney General, or officer prosecuting on the part of the state, that the person or persons claiming the said last mentioned reward is or are justly entitled to the same, under this proclamation. And I further promise a free pardon, so far as I am authorized under the constitution of this state, to any accomplice or cooperator who shall make a full discovery of the offender or offenders. And I do enjoin it upon all officers and ministers of justice, and all other persons, 
to be vigilant and active in bringing to justice the perpetrators of a crime so abhorrent to humanity, and so derogatory from the ascendancy of law and good order. Ls in witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and the privy seal, at the city of Albany, this nineteenth day of March, Anno Domini 1827. Dewitt Clinton. Number 30. Referred to in page 21. The only passenger who went in the stage from Rochester to Lewiston, on the 13th of September, 1826, the day, of course, after Morgan was taken away from Canandaigua, and the day on which he was carried from Rochester to Lewiston, was a reverend clergyman of Rochester, who officiated in some capacity at the Lewiston installation on the 14th. The stage stopped at Murdoch's Tavern, near the residence of Brown. A boy was immediately dispatched on horseback with a note from this gentleman to Brown, and a request that he would come without any delay on the same horse which the boy had ridden. Brown came accordingly, and had a private interview with the reverend gentleman. This was but a short time before he brought his horses to the same tavern, where he fed them, and waited for the carriage. At Buffalo, a man, high in office, declared that he was astonished that Miller had been permitted to go so far in printing the book, and that if Morgan should come there, there were twenty men who would take his life in less than half an hour. In Attica, a former member of the legislature declared as follows, if they are publishing the true secrets of masonry, I should not think the lives of half a dozen such men as Morgan and Miller of any consequence in suppressing the work. In Leroy, a physician, formerly sheriff of the county, declared at a public table, that the book should be suppressed if it cost every one of them their lives. In Batavia, a person holding a respectable office declared to another officer, that Miller's office would not stand there long. A justice of the peace in Leroy said, if he could catch Morgan on the bridge in the night he would find the bottom of that mill pond. A judge of the county court of Genesee said, that whatever Morgan's fate might have been, he deserved it, he had forfeited his life. A high priest of the order at Leroy said, that Morgan deserved death, he hoped he had received it, a common death was too good for him. A justice of the peace in Middlebury, a sober, respectable man, said publicly, that a man had a right to pledge his life, and then observed to those who answered him, what can you do? What can a rat do with a lion? Who are your judges? Who are your sheriffs? And who will be your jurymen?